momentarily. And Judy will introduce our speakers for today. Uh, yeah, should we get started? Can everyone hear me? Sorry for the awful audio. Um, thank you for coming to the last session. Um, so today we have um, two speakers as usual, um, speaking on public narratives and we're actually to have them. So first we'll have um, Dr. Ruth Wodak, who is the Everetta Distinguished Professor of Discourse Studies at Lancaster University in the UK, um, and is also affiliated with um, the University of Vienna. Um, her career is extremely distinguished, and honestly, she has too many achievements and positions and awards that are both like scholarly, but also very public facing. Um, so I'm like, not going to try to name or pick any of them. Um, but she really has shaped a whole field um, that applies like reverse linguistic methods to public discourse, to real political and cultural narratives in the wild. Um, so I really hope that we will be hearing some of that today. Um, and then our second um, guest we're also extremely excited to have is um, Dr. Michael Dahlstrom, who is the director of the Greenlee School of Journalism and Communication at Iowa State University. Um, he also holds a liberal arts and sciences um, dean's professorship. So his research um, explores how storytelling impacts the communication of science um, and the ethical considerations involved. So his work extends across diverse um, contexts, including risk, health, agricultural, and environmental communication. Um, and so I hope the two talks um, will really complement each other. And um, yeah, so we'll have a great discussion after this. Too. Um, so with that. Um, Ruth, if you want to take it away, and try screen. Sure. It's the third time now I'm trying to share my screen. Yay. OK, it worked. <clears throat> so thank you for inviting me. And uh, I must say that I'm in, at, in the evening, and you're basically probably all in the morning. Um, so I will start by with a quote um, by Hannah Arendt, who has been uh, cited a lot in the last uh, couple of years, especially doing with crisis and measures and totalitarianism. And I will be speaking about propaganda and the impact of new old propaganda and the public narratives which are created and enforced. And I think this quote really sums it up very well. So Hannah Arendt in The Origins of Totalitarianism on <clears throat> wrote amongst many other much quoted um, passages, in an ever-changing, incomprehensible world, the masses had reached the point where they would, at the same time, believe everything and nothing, think that everything was possible and that nothing was true. And it seems that we're living in a world where exactly this is the case. Uh, so what we thought was long gone was actually not gone at all, but was very much the case again which is the, the creation of big lies, myths, and parallel discourse worlds. So what are big lies? The construction of second realities. Here I go back to Roland Barthes' sense of myths, uh, myths which are created and by the powerful people and our semiological systems or worldviews, which are naturalized and basically try to colonize or to oppose uh, realities. And this leads me to one of the writers who has done this, who has probably written one of the most important novels about this, which is Orwell and his Ministry of Truth which is, of course, the Ministry of Propaganda, which controls and manufactures truth via propaganda. I just want to remind you of three slogans uh, in 1984 in the so-called Newspeak, where war is peace, freedom is slavery, and ignorance is strength. Uh, and you might 
want to think of several powerful people who are doing or who used to do just that. Uh, that means actually always mean the opposite when you say something. So just some examples of big lies, and I won't say something about all of them because otherwise my 20 minutes would pass very quickly, but I do want to point you to Boris Johnson and the pro-Brexit camp and the big lie which seems to have persuaded many people to vote for Brexit, which was that exiting the European Union would actually imply an extra 350 million uh, British pounds every week for the nat National Health Service. This, of course, was not true and it never came to happen, but it did uh, accomplish uh, a very successful big lie. Many people thought that the NHS would be saved by exiting the European Union. I have to point to Donald Trump. Of course, you all know this very well, that actually Joe Biden lost the election and that he only became president through fraud, uh, a second world which has been created and which is opposed to uh, the, the real world and which many people seem to believe in. Or, and this is my case today, Vladimir Putin, the president of the Russian Federation, who actually called the invasion of Ukraine a specially, special military operation against what he said, neo-Nazism. And uh, in that way, this was a protection of the Russian Federation and actually not an invasion. So we see that some of the very powerful people, the leaders of certain societies and nation states have created and continue to create big lies to justify and legitimize certain policies which they believe are important. So what I'm interested today is how are big lies and how is this information propagated and how does this subsequently become normalized? That means why do people actually believe this? I've not mentioned Stalin or Hitler, but you saw that in the list which I showed uh, beforehand. So let me go now to the theory which I <clears throat> uh, would like to propose and put forward. And that theory consists of, on the one hand, the genre of narratives, the strategies of, leg of legitimation, and schemes of argumentation, which when brought together, uh, <clears throat> actually uh, construct certain elements of propaganda, which are very powerful. Now, let me first say to some, a few words about narratives. Coming from a linguistic point of view, I'm a sociolinguist and discourse analyst, and this is why I come from this kind of perspective. Uh, of course, the history of narratives is very long, but I would like to just mention two very important theoretical frameworks uh, up to date. The first one is Vladimir Propp's narratives. Vladimir Propp was a formalist and a literary scientist. And when analyzing uh, folk tales in, uh, in Russia at that time, he found that there are 31 generic narratives which uh, construct the folk tales and uh, which uh, display 31 functions performed by eight characters like heroes, villains, victims, and so forth. So all these functions are always, um, always appear in all these folk tales but they also appear in most of the narratives and myths uh, which we have analyzed in identity politics and also in propaganda. Uh, the other very important nar narrative theory, which probably most of you know, is by Labov and Valetsky, uh, which has come to be the foundation of many other new uh, elaborations of this theory. And they, uh, have put forward six elements of narratives. 
uh, the abstract, which announces that a speaker has a story to tell and summarizes briefly the orientation uh, that uh, introduces the characters, time, place, situation, complicated action. So what actually happened, the sequence of events, and that is uh, the, the most important and constitutive part of a narrative. If nothing happens, you have nothing to speak about. There's no story to tell. Then you evaluate uh, that sequence of uh, events. And this is where the moral uh, and values usually come forward. Then what happened finally, uh, the result or resolution and then the coda on the meta level, a meta comment, uh, what you actually learn from this story. So the second part uh, of this theoretical framework is legitimation uh, strategies. And here I draw a lot on my work with Theo van Leuven. And I want to only point to two of these uh, legitimation strategies via discourse. The one is always appealing to authority to justify your action or your belief systems. And the second one is to point to values, to some kind of moral, uh, which then also justifies and legitimi legitimizes your uh, action or your proposal. There are other rationalization and mythopoesis, which don't, which are not as important in uh, the moral narratives in propaganda. And thirdly, I want to uh, go to argumentation schemes and the work by Douglas Walton, who has elaborated a whole list and taxonomy of strategies and arguments where only a few are important, and that is how arguments are embedded in narratives and how narratives can actually be used as an argument, uh, as an example for people to be persuaded of a certain proposal, then that there is some kind of legitimation, appeals to authorities, statistics, opinion polls, values, fallacies, that means uh, certain argumentation schemes which uh, are not uh, true to uh, reason, appeals to intuition, common sense, and emotion. And finally, how is propaganda spread by manipulation and instrumentalization of all accessible media channels? And I want to show in what way Vladimir Putin has done this to justify and legitimize the invasion of the Ukraine. Now, Vladimir Putin has given a whole lot of speeches. The speech I want to look at is the speech um, which he gave <coughs> on um, the 21st of September uh, this year. Uh, this means about six months after the invasion and the speech where he legitimizes partial mobilization. That means this is the first time he actually con admits that there is something like a war, because up to date, people in Russia were not told that there is a war or an invasion. They were told there's just a special military operation used to liberate uh, the Ukraine from a neo-Nazi regime uh, which seized power in 2014 as the result of an armed state coup. So this is the way the abstract is formulated and it immediately shows that there is a victim perpetrator reversal. That means uh, those who are the perpetrators are now presented as victims. Then we have the orientation where Putin says the issue concerns the necessary imperative measures to protect Russia and support the desire and will of our compatriots to choose their day future independently. And in red, bold red, I have, uh, pre I present the way the villains are now described. This is the West, the Western elites who want to preserve their domination, block and suppress any sovereign and independent development 
and continue to aggressively force their will and pseudo values on other countries and nations. So you see the adjectives which are used to portray both victims and perpetrators and how polarized his description is between us, uh, the Russian Federation, which he wants to pr uh, protect, and the aggressive West. And now come sub-narratives, and I will only show a few. Uh, first, we have sub-narrative one in this speech. The goal of that part of the West is to weaken, divide, and ultimately destroy a country. And then he says, uh, they devised these plans long ago. And here you have the beginning of a narrative uh, with this <coughs> abstract and uh, situating it in temporarily in the past. Uh, they encouraged groups of international terrorists and moved NATO's offensive infrastructure close to our borders. They used indiscriminate Russophobia as a weapon by nurturing the hatred of Russia. So he can justify uh, that these, the West was terrible. They were, they actually used international terrorists. They have an indiscriminate Russophobia. They organized a genocide blockade and terror against those who refu refused to uh, recognize the government, uh, etc. So you have a complete narrative which is used now to justify the special military operation. And he legitimizes now that he one has to start a preemptive military operation was necessary and the only option. The main goal was to liberate the whole of Donbas, one of the regions in the Ukraine, uh, where he claims that this was uh, a victim of the West. And now he says he needs a special military operation, uh, which he wants to make public first time today, and that Kiev representatives voiced quite a positive response to our proposal, but again, a peaceful settlement obviously did not suit the West. So again, we have a complete disinformation as far as we know from the media, and we are all dependent on media, of course. Actually, the West wanted a, and Ukraine wanted a peaceful settlement and negotiations, but the Russians didn't want to talk. And then we have the sub-narrative too. There were over 7.5 million people living in Donetsk. Many of them were forced to become refugees and leave their homes. And missile attacks were launched by neo-Nazi militants. Of course, this is a description of uh, the group of people of the Ukraine living in the Ukraine, that they are all fascists, uh, which now it would take too long to explain probably how and why Putin comes to uh, label them as neo-Nazis, but it is obviously disinformation, who fire at hospitals and schools, which the Russians did, and stage terrorist attacks against civilian, uh, peaceful civilians. So that is the second story we got. And now he concludes, we cannot, we have no moral right to let our kin and be torn to pieces by butchers. We cannot but respond to their sincere striving to decide their destiny on their own. So this is how he legitimizes the uh, special military operation and the partial uh, military mobilization that they have to respond to attack and not that they actually invade it. So we have a, an example of a second reality uh, which is opposed to the reality which uh, we all were informed about by uh, very serious media. media. And then we get the summary, uh, a, a third sub-narrative. The West has gone too far in its aggressive anti-Russian policy. They have even resorted to the nuclear blackmail. Again, this is completely reversal of victims and perpetrators because we know that the, Putin actually threatened to use uh, nuclear weapons, uh, tactical nuclear weapons, and not the West. And now then he 
uh, reassures the citizens of Russia that the territorial integrity of our motherland, our independence and freedom will be defended. I repeat, by all the systems available to us. And then comes a, a threat. Those who are using nuclear blackmail against us should know that the wind rose can turn around, resulting, uh, referring now to a common metaphor of natural catastrophes, the winds, the water, etc., cetera, uh, which uh, essentializes, or he tries to essentialize his narrative. And then he refers to the past, uh, which is one of the argumentative schemes very frequently used. It is our historical tradition and the destiny of our nation to stop those who are keen on global domination and threaten to split up and enslave, enslave our motherland. Rest assured that we will do it this time as well, namely protect. I believe in your support and here he appeals to the people. So if I sum this up in a uh, attempt to construct this also as an argumentative scheme, it is very simple and in this way also very attractive uh, when talking to the people, Russia is in danger, Ukraine is in danger, uh, the West wants to weaken, divide, and destroy Russia. The West has even resorted to nuclear blackmail. This is his sub-narratives. And then come two moral narratives. Since Russia has always protected their citizens, uh, you can rest assured it will do it now too. A special operation is necessary and the army is strong enough. And all of this will, he concludes, defend the Russian motherland or homeland and its citizens against the neo-Nazis in the Ukraine and the aggressive West. So we have a very simple uh, structure of this speech, um, which can be deconstructed in this way and which shows how moral narratives are continuously used to substantiate uh, his military actions. So to sum up, moral narratives are instrumentalized to legitimize, justify, and argue for or against specific actions. Moral narratives can have a wide range of functions, specifically in identity politics, in describing the motherland and how uh, this has always been protected and will be protected again. In this way, also rewriting history, which again is not Putin's speciality, but has is a speciality of uh, every national identity politics. And moral narratives function as valid examples in persuasive rhetoric and propaganda. And this is the so-called argumentum ad exemplum, where you use a narrative as an example to substantiate and justify what you uh, have planned to do. So creating a second reality, which is what we can uh, observe in Putin's case, also substantiated by neologisms and euphemisms, which I cannot go into now, but which really remind one of uh, Orwell's 1984, instead of saying war, you say special military operation. And instead of actually saying Ukrainians or the, uh, the opponents, you talk of neo-Nazis, you exaggerate. So there is the use of all uh, kinds of detailed elements as well uh, to construct the second reality. So Putin's means of propaganda, at least from looking at three speeches and now uh, showing you and illustrating it with this one speech, elaborate arguments are embedded in narratives, get people to believe something they did not believe before. And this is possible in Russia because uh, the internet is widely closed and many people have no access to internet, but are uh, dependent on television. Uh, so in that way, this second reality is really orchestrated in the sense of Douglas Walton, that means manipulated and, instrument in, and instrum instrumentalized uh, uh, 
uh, of all accessible media channels, especially television, to produce a cumulative message. No other media opinions, voices, etc., are permitted. And as you might know, people who oppose uh, the second reality are um, sanctioned negatively in massive ways. They're either put into prison or sent into a camp. Uh, so in that way, this one narrative is uh, really orchestrated uh, via all available channels. And uh, this gives us uh, a clue, I think, an important clue of why up to date there is so little opposition or uh, noticeable opposition in Russia or in the Russian Federation because people have no voice or very little voice. And if they have voice, they're silenced very quickly as it happens in a dictatorship. So I think uh, this gives us also a really good view of what happens when um, states become authoritarian and when exactly this quote of Hannah Arendt, uh, which I read out at the beginning, uh, really has uh, an effect. And I would like to stop here uh, with this um, read between the lines and the lies. I think this is important and this is what we should aim to do as uh, discourse analysts and linguists, that means to uh, challenge uh, certain essentialized moral narratives and the attempt of propaganda. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ruth, for the awesome talk. Um, we have about a minute um, for a question or two, if anyone wants to raise their hand. Uh, okay, uh, question from Babak. I I pronounced that wrong. Uh, no, you did, you did right. Um, th thank you so much uh, for this talk. This was fascinating. But uh, as an Iranian, for me, the question becomes, why doesn't the same uh, kind of policy and approach to propaganda work as well in my country? Because uh, the Iranian government also tries to, you know, heavily control the internet, heavily control the narrative, the same types of exaggeration, so on and so forth. But they are very unpopular, and right now, you know, all of the country is up in arms. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts for what might have caused the difference in outcome. Well, it's difficult to say <clears throat> because. Obviously, we're also dependent on the media about what is happening in Iran. And uh, I have not been able to look at slogans or speeches. I don't speak the language and I've not found a lot of translations. But it's obvious that there are tipping points. And when uh, there is a tipping point, like in the case of the killing or the death of this uh, one woman, which uh, sort of uh, ex really uh, created this massive response by uh, women uh, and women started carrying uh, and of course also some men uh, started carrying the opposition on the streets and they were not afraid of being uh, beaten up and they came again and again then the force the mobilization of the masses in opposition becomes very strong. Now, this has not happened in Putin's Russia here. Yeah? Uh, there have been revolutions, and you know, there have been massive demonstrations also in Putin's Russia, but they have really been clamped down in a very strong way, and they have not um, been able to subsist over a long time like now in Iran, which has which might lead really to some changes, as also some of the powerful leaders are now voicing opposition to the very restrictive policies. Um, so it needs many things, many factors to be able to really mobilize and then have a group like these wonderful women, I can only say this from a personal point of view, who are brave enough uh, to oppose dictatorship in a way, even uh, looking into 
um, police officers and people who are uh, who are willing to kill them or to beat them up. So uh, when this tipping point comes, nobody knows. Yeah, and it can be a singular instance which can really trigger uh, the strong opposition. Up to date, this has not happened in Russia. Uh, thank you for the question, and thank you, Ruth, um, again, clap for Ruth again, and we're going to switch now over to um, Michael Bell. So take it away, Michael. All right. Well, wonderful. So thank you all. Um, I know this is an interdisciplinary group, so I thought I would start with a definition, and it's one that maybe might be somewhat novel. So my talk is on inspiring public science narratives, and I would like to start by saying that story, that I'd like to define it, is the complexity of the world filtered through the scale of human experience. So I think a good way to illustrate this is to contrast how story and science describe the world. So for instance, a mountain, science may describe how mountains are formed by the movement of tectonic plates or describe the composition of its rock. But what's the human experience? So stories might describe the inspiration from gazing at their majesty or the struggle of climbing to the summit. Let's think about time for a second. Science might describe unintuitive relations between space and time or describe methods of carbon dating, but stories describe how time flies when we're having fun or that we never seem to have enough of it or that it becomes more valuable as we realize it's running out. So on first glance, it seems that science and storytelling are opposites. Science seeks to uncover general truths about the world that are empirically true across multiple contexts, where storytelling illustrates a general truth through a particular case experienced at human scale. And so the fact that they seem so opposite is why I'm fascinated with how they intersect. So I teach an undergraduate course on science communication, and on the very first day of class, before I even introduce myself or talk about the syllabus, I open class by saying, good morning, welcome to class. What do you think about climate change? And I let them stumble around for a bit. Um, and eventually they start describing you know, what they think climate change is, but then they get into what they think we should do about it and, and you know, why it's bad, why it's good, what are the things we should do. Um, I let them say whatever they wanna say. But after that, I say, Whatever your answer was, why do you believe that? And what I want them to reflect upon is how so much of what we know about science is really based on the public narratives that we have heard about the science. And specifically, they're based on the moral narratives about what is good, what is bad, who's the hero, who's the villain, and what we should do about this science. And so while science may try to uncover general truths about the world that are empirically true, the public communication of science often becomes a competition of interpreting science through compelling moral narratives. So 2016, a study surveyed scientists who were members of the American Association for the Advancement of Science about why they thought it was important to communicate with the public about science in the first place. So I'm gonna share with you the top three answers, but first I want you to think, what would you answer? Why, why should we communicate to the public about science? What would we hope to achieve? We'll see how close you are to uh, the results. The number one reason was to educate. So things came out such as, it's important to inform people so they can make better decisions, improve society by increasing understanding about the world. Uh, this one came up a couple of times. Taxpayers funded the research. They deserve to know what they paid for. But it's this idea that we should communicate because there's a lack of knowledge and we need to fill that. We need people to know more about science. Okay, the second one is to defend science. 
This is to counter misinformation, pseudoscience, to increase support and trust towards science, to persuade audiences towards certain beliefs within contentious social issues. So even though this one is called defending science, this one is really more about persuasion. It's not, I want to give you all the information and let you make up your mind. It is, you have a wrong idea and I want to pull you towards this better idea. So climate change, COVID, I mean, all these things fall into this, but this middle bullet, increasing support and trust towards science, you know, that's something that's probably good and something we all support, but that's also persuasion. We want them to say, yes, I trust you, I support science. Most of the literature on science communication has focused on these first two, educating and persuading about science. It is the third place answer that I want to talk more about today, and that is to inspire. So these goals talk about wanting to share the wonder and awe of scientific discovery, to help audiences appreciate the world around them, and to get people excited about future possibilities. And this is quite a bit different than the other ones because I can be inspired about science. I can, I can be in awe of something and not really understand it. And so this is one where this goal of inspiration is mentioned often. So as we said, it was the third most mentioned with this survey of scientists, but you can see it everywhere in the National Academy of Sciences, um, descriptions of science education, it's one of the goals. So inspiring is mentioned a lot, but there isn't much conceptualization of what it actually means or why even attempting to do so is worthwhile. So I find it interesting for that, but also it represents a very particular type of public facing moral narrative that attempts to use storytelling to elicit these feelings of awe and wonder towards science. So the emotions of awe and wonder have a long history in philosophy, but were generally ignored within cognitive sciences until about the last couple decades. And so from a lot of psychology, we know that awe arises when an individual is faced with an external stimulus that so exceeds their expectations that requires a reorganization of their mental schema to even comprehend it. And two of kind of the vocab words here, this break in expectations is caused by an experience with vastness, uh, which is commonly conceptualized as something large, you know, physical size, space, mountains, uh, but it can be anything that embodies this dimension that can break expectations. So the complexity of soil microbes, the deep time of the past, all can have that vastness. And then the second one is need for combination. Uh, once someone experiences this vastness and realizes they cannot comprehend it with their normal schema, the need for combination means I now have to readjust how I think about the world in order to comprehend what I'm seeing. Literature, some of it has found that people who experience awe have positive and profound effects on altruistic behaviors, pro-social attitudes, and general well-being. People focus more on how they fit within larger systems and much less on the self. In fact, there was a, a line of studies that I thought was really interesting. They had people draw themselves on a piece of paper and if they were experiencing awe, they actually drew themselves much smaller. So they were smaller compared to the area of the paper. So this is interesting. So we know that people who have these experiences have these moral, these transcendental effects. But the question is, uh, science would seem to be well situated to serve as a context for awe and wonder because it redefines what we know about the world in novel and often surprising ways. But like I said, there's not much literature that has combined awe and wonder with science and science communication. And so while science may find something awe-inspiring about the world, science communicators have little guidance for sharing that awe with audiences or even justifying why attempting to do so is worthwhile. So an important first step in trying to understand this would be to give voice to the professional science communication experts who have spent years inspiring audiences across varied media contexts and situations. 
because this is their job. They have wrestled with this, so it would be good to learn from them. And so thanks to funding from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, that's exactly what we did. And so I want to take some time to share initial results of a study that we just completed. So we conducted 28 semi-structured in-depth interviews with established professional science communicators who specialize in creating experiences to instill awe and wonder in public audiences. Real quick for inclusion, in order to be uh, included in the study, participants had to be associated with a public part portfolio of science communication products demonstrating a recurring focus on themes of awe and wonder. So a lot of communicators sometimes write a story about this or create something, but we wanted people who this has been their focus. And we also wanted people who have met a sufficient mastery of their craft. So they had to have been publicly recognized for their work on creating awe, inspiring science experiences, either through connection to esteemed professional outlets or competitive nominations or awards. Um, so some examples, we had people who have worked with New York Times, BBC Studios, The Atlantic. Uh, we talked to people who had won Pulitzer Prizes, E.O. Wilson Literacy Science Writing Award, Andrew Carnegie Medal for Nonfiction. So we really got people who were the top of the craft who have worked on this for a long time. 28 participants, 12 focused primarily on published writings, five focused on television and film, four worked across both film and writing, and seven focused primarily on museums and other informal educational contexts. Okay, so I wanna do a quick summary of some of the things we found. So the first research question we wanted to ask is how do they conceptualize awe and wonder? So we know what the literature says, but for the people who are actually doing this, what is it? And so they mentioned the vastness, which comes from the literature. But what was more novel is that they connected it more to complexity. So it's not scale, it's not all this, but it was the idea that within science, no matter what it is you're looking at, there are levels of complexity that you can always go deeper. And I'm going to put up some quotes from some of our participants that I think capture some of these ideas. So this one said, um, our emotional states that we can experience, a recognition and deep appreciation for complexity and beauty of existence of nature, whatever it is you're marveling at. So they were talking about how space, even down to a leaf, there's always complexity. You can go deeper into the molecular structure. You can broaden out to the ecological connections, but they really thought of it as complexity. Need for accommodation was also brought up, but it was seen more as a communication tool rather than a cognitive reaction. So for instance, this person said, it's an emotionary primary, not a cognitive experience, but the profound impact of that emotion can change the cognitive framing that someone's consciousness lives in. And I found it to be one of the most important tools in public education and advocacy that are available to communicators. There was a lot of agreement that science was uniquely suited for awe and wonder. Science is the easiest way to create awe that we have access to because you have a substantive, thorough understanding of matters of scale that no other discipline can touch. So their conceptualizations were very much in line with what the literature said, but they had some, some nice connections with communication. Okay, a big one was, what's the purpose of awe and wonder? So why... Have they dedicated their lives to this? What do they hope will happen? And we prompted, we prompted participants to describe what they saw as the outcomes. And participants touched on many of the things, again, from the literature, um, increase in pro-social attitudes, general well-being. But one thing that came out very clearly, there was a dominant lay theory that a lot of these participants thought that there was this direct connection that when people experienced on wonder, it would impact their attitudes in a pro-science direction through some form of emotional engagement. And I thought the clearest articulation of that was this, science gets out lobbied by industry when it comes to the allocation of government funds all over the world, not just in wealthy Western nations. On wonder about science helps scientists tell influential stories about the research, which will result in more funding because people will get the social and emotional story of how science can preserve lives and quality of life. So this 
this is an empirical question and there has not been much theorizing about what are these connections? Does it lead to pro-science attitudes? So this I thought was very interesting. However, not all agreed. So I would say why this by far was dominant, there was a smaller group that really opposed that idea. So for instance, if you can evoke feelings of awe or wonder, you can get people to read about things they otherwise wouldn't be interested in. I see that as a matter of craft rather than this very transactional thing that has to have a goal about boosting or celebrating science. I think a lot of the people who are doing the best work are not thinking like that. This group also introduced this idea of a mode of transfer where it's not that they're just trying to get the audience to feel on wonder, but that they first have to feel it. And so this person said, you have to pick a topic that resonates with you. It's not what other people did. It's not because you want to emulate other filmmakers' feelings. It's a bit of self-exploration to go what matters to me. And so the people talked about how first they had to feel that on wonder about whatever their topic was in order to be able to communicate it. The third question we really wanted to ask about were what were the techniques for awe and wonder? So a lot of the literature that's trying to manipulate feelings of awe and wonder are using video clips or are trying to ask people to write about times that they felt on wonder. And we wanted to say to these professionals, how do you do it? What are some of the techniques? Uh, topics about or, or thoughts about whether or not the right you have to pick the right topic or the right medium were very mixed so some participants thought that there were some topics like physics and dinosaurs and space and ancient history that lent themselves more easily to on wonder but many of them said back to that complexity it doesn't matter it's based more on how you tell the story than what it is medium was another one a couple of participants thought that interactive exhibits or possibly film lent themselves more naturally to evoking on wonder, but many of them said all media have unique strengths, and if the communication is built toward those aims, it'll be effective. And I thought this captured that quite well. Everyone just gets distracted by whatever format is new and fatty and interesting without thinking about the core skills and principles. If you can't inspire in a thousand word blog post, chances are you're not gonna be able to build a good video game or a documentary that holds up to an IMAX screen. So while those were mixed, what was almost universally agreed was that the most impactful decisions in successfully communicating on wonder was based on storytelling decisions. And these two cross-cutting themes emerged. The first one, was the importance of using traditional narrative structures. So dramatic plot arcs, correct pacing, three-act structure, because those are expected within how people normally experience these narratives. And so that can serve as a scaffold to draw audiences into more novel content and more novel topics that might be more difficult to understand. The second theme was the importance of creating human-focused stories by connecting the abstract to the human experience. And this came up a lot because if the goal is to communicate these broad, vast general truths in complexity, you have to also connect that down to the level of how humans experience it. And if you focus too much on the small, you lose the vast. If you focus too much on the vast, then you can't get to the personification. So I do want to show one quick video. So this is one that captures what uh, a lot of them were talking about in trying to connect the vast to the particular. This is from um, One Earth. This is kind of your, your typical big budget wildlife documentary. This is on Netflix. This is on BBC. Um, but one of the participants worked on this scene and we, we spent a lot of time talking about it. So this is one, um, I will give a little warning. It is might be a little difficult to watch because there are some animals uh, that die, but it's one that he spent a lot of time saying, they spent a lot of time in their production team deciding whether or not to show this. And in the end, they decided to because it tries to tell a story, a very moral story about connecting climate change to something uh, smaller.
At the top of the 80 meter cliffs, they rest until it's time to return to the sea in search of food. That's the last little section, is it? The really steep bit, and they all just. It's a really steep that bit. One's gonna go. There's one right on the edge. Okay. Um, was that the end? Oh no, I'm I'm resharing okay. my screen. Okay. I was like, oh no. <laughs> okay, so I don't know if uh anyone followed up on that, but uh the uh the documentary th that was that was controversial. So they there was some critique of whether or not they should have shown that. There was some critique of whether or not that was actually uh, accurate if it was based on climate change or if they were turning that into the story. Um, but I think it it shows an example of what these professional communicators, uh, the decisions that they make to try and elicit emotions of awe and wonder about science and connecting these vast ideas such as climate change down to something at the human level. And so just a quick summary to close up. The public communication of science depends heavily on interpretations through moral narratives. And communicating awe and wonder about science is often championed, but remains understudied, and I think is very ripe for more understanding of how we can use public narratives in this uh, aim of communicating science. So thank you very much. Thank you so much um, for also an excellent talk. Um, we have time for questions. Anyone wants to raise their hand? I think actually Walter has a question in the chat if you want to. Walter, if you want to, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, very interesting work. I just wanted to ask whether there are any differences between that you found in your group between social sciences and natural sciences, uh, because in particular, for example, you know, do people feel as much awe when they do psychology as when they do, say, astronomy? Yes, that is an excellent topic. And that, so we actually... In some of our conversations, we started prodding at that because a lot of times when we left it open and said, you know, tell us your definition, it was a lot of what you'd experience as more of the, you know, traditional sciences, you know, environment, nature, space, uh, archaeology. Um, and so most of the examples that participants cited were in that area. But when we asked about psychology and social sciences, they said, again, to that complexity, awe is still there. It's still very possible to do that. 
But they also talked about how, especially when the film and video and some of the uh, informal ed, they also have to justify to someone higher up that this is something worth investing in. And they said a lot of that hits the wall. It's, so it's harder to sell to someone else to invest in a, a social science story than it is uh, dinosaurs or sharks or something like that where there's already a track record. But but on the conceptual level, they pretty much all agreed that yes, you know, there's no there's no barrier to something not being inspiring. It's just finding that storytelling to connect the vastness with the complexity. Thank you. And for one more question, Caleb. Thanks, Michael. Um, I was wondering um, towards the end there with the, the walrus example, whether that was a case of awe or, or tragedy, because it does seem like um, a lot of these nature documentaries will start off by building a sense of awe, sort of developing this deep emotional connection between the viewers and, and nature. And then that sort of sets up for this tragedy of, of human intervention and then that call to action. I was wondering, do, do you think of the tragedy as a kind of awe or, or do you think those, those two are separate? Well, so a lot of times, well, I don't know, I don't know if a lot of times, uh, awe, I think often we think of as a positive emotion, like, oh, I'm amazed at, at the stars or that mountain is, is wonderful. But the definition is, is not positive or negative, it's both. I mean, awe is also the terror of a thunderstorm or you know, when you realize that you're powerless, that's also the awe. And so the, the walrus example, yeah, it's very much tragedy. It's very much, and, and the participant even said, you know, they put it in there to shock, to be able to say, you know, this is something real. But the idea was it's still awe. It's kind of, it breaks that, that expectation that that's not going to happen to those animals. And so I have to re, reconceptualize how I view the world based on it. So I, I know I almost didn't show that because it's such a downer of a clip. I had, I had other ones of like fun things with mushrooms and an octopus, but this one, I thought it really captures the decision-making that they have to make. And then they took some heat for it. Great. Um, that concludes our moral narrative workshop. Um, Molly, you want to say a final word? Sure. Um, thank you. Thank you to our speakers and our audience. Um, we are hoping that this will continue beyond uh, this semester. So um, stay tuned for some information about what happens next. We're, we're in the process of, of thinking about that. But um, I, I hope you'll all agree that this has been a really just brilliant set of speakers and ideas. I've learned so much and I really also appreciate the great questions and engagement from our audience. So thank you all and um, we hope to stay connected.